Hello and welcome to Trad Jazz Today. Dan Zeilinger has been a world-traveling trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of his most memorable performances were on the lawn of the Edinburgh Castle, at the Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials around the world. Dan has met many people during his career and has spent many hours on and off stage with these musicians, talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on weekends with their friends. They all have stories worthy of a movie script, and through these interviews, Dan will be sharing them with you. Now, Dan Zeilinger. This is Dan Zeilinger with Trad Jazz Today. My next guest has had the unfortunate experience of spending a lot of time in both studios and on stages with me. Um, one of the original members of the 10th Avenue Jazz Band from back in 1988 and a continued member. And I believe uh, on occasion you front, you front the band by that name still. And that's uh, Mr. Lewis Kaiser. Lewis, how are you, sir? Well, pretty well for an old man who's nearly 80. <laughs> I'm only behind you by about five years, so. <laughs> well, that's not true. I guess I just lied. About 10 years. Oh, yeah. But that, that's beside the point. How have you been? Well, we just moved from Menlo Park with my wife. I was remarried a year ago. <clears throat> and we moved uh, from Menlo Park to Marina Village on Alameda Island uh, in the Bay Area. I've been playing with an awful lot of Bay Area musicians. So, uh, in fact, right after this interview, after we rush over to Palo Alto, we have our last outdoor jam session of the... Uh, of the year and maybe for until spring for uh, a band called the Silicon Gulch Jazz Band, which uh, uh, is run by now by a woman uh, named Joyce Taylor and has some pretty good players in it. And uh, it's kind of the core of the South Bay Traditional Jazz Society. But mostly okay. what, I, what I've been gigging and what I've mostly been doing is playing modern jazz, you know, at Savannah Jazz and places, but all the gigs dried up, they're all gone. No, oh, I understand. I'm in the same boat. Yeah. I had a I had a steady Friday trad gig I was doing, and and we just have to be patient, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, you are originally from Beaverton, Oregon. Yeah. Amazing. Um. Uh, I feel a lot of Oregonians have transport as uh, the, ended up in California. It seems, uh, and a lot of jazz players came out of that area. Well, you know, I was actually originally from North Bend, Oregon, where I was born. That's where I first picked up the trumpet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, loved it, and I practiced it every day for a couple of hours. Um, now, were your parents musical? Uh, no, nobody in the family. But uh, when I was in seventh and eighth grade, we had a, a, high school, a, a middle school band teacher named Mr. Betts, and he brought, brought his best trumpet and clarinet and other you know instruments together to make a little Dixieland band, and he gave us a he had one of these you know books just like you have the stars and stripes in or something you know for marching. Well, it was Dixieland. It was you know the things like uh, uh, you know Basin Street Blues and, and and all that kind of stuff. And we would rehearse once a week, and then we'd get out of school to go over to other schools and do concerts every Friday. So it was a pretty good gig. <laughs> that's a good band director. Yeah, right. And then when I got into high school, that's when uh, I met Ed Zimbrick. Uh, and uh, he he and I, uh, I, I won all these contests. I was a really hot little trumpet player. I, I Still was, are, by the way, Lewis. Well, I, I, was, <laughs> I was principal trumpet in the all-Northwest band and all kinds of an orchestra and all that stuff. And uh, Ed and I... There was a, we had a dance band that our, our band director put together that I played in, but um, uh, you were allowed to to come into the small group called the Swing Masters, which mm -hmm. got, got gigs every weekend at other high schools, and you'd go to the band room, and you'd pick up all the stands and all the music, and you'd go out, you'd uh, talk to the people, get the money, come back, put it all back, have the keys to the band room, everything. And that was considered to be a, a real elite thing. And you weren't allowed to do it until you were a junior, because that's when people could start driving. But uh, they let me in when I was a sophomore. 
and uh, I used to ride with Ed. And so Ed and I have a long history. It goes back a long, a long, long time. When, but when we left high school, when he left, he was actually uh, picked up by Monty Ballou's Castle Jazz Band. Right. And that's where he learned everything. In fact, the guy that taught him an awful lot there was a guy named Jerry Hermans, who was a fantastic piano player, knew at everything, you know. And uh, later, Jim Buckman, I think, played with the, with the band. But I didn't go. I didn't go that way. I went a different route when I got out of high. Well, before I got out of high school, I was playing in um, coffee houses and playing, you know, Miles Davis stuff and all that kind of stuff. That's what I was doing. Was playing the modern jazz route. I didn't get into Dixieland until about again until about 1970. Uh, when was it? When I uh, when I started teaching at uh, UC Santa Cruz, I think it was 1969, 1970, uh, and I decided I was stuck in a in a in a in a bag that I couldn't get out of the Miles Davis bags, and I had to go back to the roots. So I that's when I got affiliated with Jake Stock and the Abalone Stompers and different people like that, and, and went and played the. I started at the second Sacramento Jubilee with the band there. Jake wouldn't go because it didn't pay enough. So uh, we went there with a, a bunch of other real good players and I got a chance of, you know, like to play with Bobby Hackett and all kinds of people. Wow. I still play with Jake, by the way, every so often. Pardon? I still play with Jake Stock every so often. With Jay. I'm sorry. Well, oh, with Jay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Jay's still alive. Jake's yeah. dead. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hey, Jay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I played with Jay uh, every Every couple of years, we play for a, an event down in Monterey. I don't know if we can go down and do it anymore, but uh, yeah. Now, were you playing? Were you playing uh, Miles through uh, Hull, uh, through your high school career, and a little bit, at, and right after that, or uh, in other words, were you still playing as a musician in more modern styles? Uh, in in uh, through the high school career, we, we played the American Songbook and special arrangements that were made oh, yeah. in our little band. So that's how I learned all the. All the stuff, you know, for the you know regular tunes that everybody does on the dance gig, you know. Uh, but uh, then I also went and to uh, to other places and learned, you know, modern stuff. That we didn't have uh, jazz fake books back then. You just learned it by ear. You know? Right. As you know. <laughs> um, well, yeah, uh, uh, it's really interesting um, when you're talking about Miles. His relationship with the early jazz is is kind of interesting uh, because he sort of tried to divorce himself as much as he could from the idea. Although I understood he was a fan of Louis. Yeah. Oh well, you got to be a fan of Louis if you play <laughs> trumpet or cornet. If you're not, you're an idiot. <laughs> you're not a you're not a you're not a jazz musician. <laughs> Yeah, I got lucky with, with uh, Ed's band because uh, we had some fantastic players. This is before you were in the band. Of course, yeah. We used to bring uh, Ed Metz Jr. and um, Dave Gannett and, uh, of course, uh, uh, Jim, Buc Jim Buckman. Uh, put together this fantastic band, Charlie Clark played piano and uh, played around, you know, a different kind of concert jazz clubs and things like that and that was uh, a fantastic experience to play with those that were all, all the old black dogs people you know right right yeah well i i, I know dave and, and i i think I, when i was with the band ed hired jim for a couple gigs still back yeah. uh, when i got into it and uh, obviously i had the chance to play with you a lot incredible bands i think one of the things that's most underestimated is what an excellent musician ed was Oh, his, yeah. his, his musical expertise is, was just phenomenal. Well, you know what happened is that uh, he formed his own band as well as playing in the uh, Monty Blues Castle Jazz Band. He formed a band called Tenth Avenue Jazz Band, and it had uh, some really good young players in it, including Buckland, I think. And uh, and then he what he did is he just took down off the all the old seventy eights. He he wrote out the Jelly Roll Morton stuff and everything, you know, and had a whole repertoire of that. Uh, when he and I met again after having not seen each other for 20 years in, at, a, at a gig in 1989 or something, 
uh, we put together a band called the California Rhythm Kings, and uh, uh, we use that repertoire, and that's one of the ways I was able to learn a hell of a lot more. I, I, I already had, I had my, my father-in-law, uh, the woman I was married to at the time, was a great jazz fan, and they were buddies with Lou Waters. And you know, Lou Waters was the guy who started the whole San Francisco uh, renewal of trad jazz. And uh, so when uh, I would used to go to their house and record on cassettes all their old 78 labels because he would go with his friends around to the black neighborhoods and buy their old okay labels and things you know so i learned a whole lot of stuff from that but then i got in a band uh that uh uh was was re led by a guy who was kind of a, a, a an asshole but i won't mention his name but uh had really good players we had a trombone player from the uh, from the basie band we had a Don Brayton, who was a tuba two player, played at the White House. Uh, we had a really good piano player that knew everything. And, but we had a, a clarinet player that really wasn't. He was just a good sort of traditional, I mean, a, a classical player. Uh, but he, uh, but my, my ex-wife's father uh, called Lou Waters, who was now living in Kotati as, and working as a cook. And he said, could these guys come down and get a copy of your book, you know, because it, it wasn't out then. Waters stuff was not out. So we went down, and the guy went down and made all these copies. So we had an entire book, which I still have, of all the Lou Waters stuff. And we played that. And the way it worked is this, cl this clarinet player wasn't any good at improvising, but we would have him play the second trumpet part up an octave. And it sounded pretty good. And we got gigs. I mean, we played for the America, uh, California Cancer Society with. And, uh, you know, uh, Raquel Welch was there and, uh, uh, you know, big, big, uh, big shot guys came and sat in with us who could play piano and all that. We got paid 125, which was a lot of money back oh, then. Oh, gosh. It still, it still is, unfortunately. <laughs> Unheard of now. <laughs> but that's how uh, I got the book and I, I learned all that stuff, you know, the Riverside Blues and all that stuff. And so that I got quite an orientation into into trad jazz as well as modern jazz. And a lot of people were critical of my <clears throat> trad jazz playing because they saw they it didn't sound like the scratches on the record, you know. I was not trying to copy Dick Spiderbeck and all that. But we, we did a we did a concert, Ed's band, we went down I don't think you were on this one to Australia. I've, oh, I've been on a couple of them to Australia. It may not may not, not have been the same one that you're remembering. Yeah, and uh, but uh, when we went there, we played, you know, it was all trad jazz, and we went to all these places. And the people in the audience had learned all their trad jazz through the Lou Waters, because the Lou Waters book went to Australia, because it was published later. And that was before Jim Neighbors put out his book, which has got a lot of mistakes in it. But yeah. anyway, so... Uh, so we would go there and we're playing something like uh, what the hell is that tune? It's a clarinet thing. Uh, and, and the whole audience would sing, sing it with the band. They would sing it and they knew it by heart. You know, we were sitting here playing this, thinking we were doing something really hot. And these people, well, you know. <laughs> My introduction into, into the style actually I was playing second cornet in a off the waters book with a band in Orange County uh, called the Orange Peelers, and uh, oh, his book has made it down to Southern California. Also, I guess uh, Paul Waltz and a few of the guys, Larry Wright, had traveled up to him and and uh, saw him at the trailer and and brought and brought a copy of his book back too. So I that's kind of where I stepped into the whole the whole trad pile myself. Up until uh, up until 1980, I was a Latin band and big band lead player, trumpet player. You're playing trumpet. Yeah, I've heard you play trumpet before. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, I was going to say uh, after after I I have too bad I can't play these cuts, but I have some incredible playing uh, cuts with uh, from the uh, in the early 90s with. Uh, 
with Ed and, and, and some bands. We used to go up and, and play uh, in the Easter concerts and do things up in Portland, and I recorded some of it. But anyway, I was going to say that uh, the, uh, the, the guy who came in on clarinet after Buckland, uh, Joe, what's his name? He's played, had the hot frog. Ashworth. Yeah, Joe Ashworth, who's, who's passed away now. Uh, and uh, he came in, and uh, I, we had had a, a, bit, a, a bit of a falling out. Uh, <laughs> I think mean, everybody's had a bit of a falling out with Joe. Well, it, actually, what happened is I was, uh, we were playing concerts up in, I think, in Canada or something like that. And Buckland was in the band, and <clears throat> they asked me to plug something in in the sound system, and I didn't know that the sound was turned way up on a certain speaker. Buckman was over by that speaker when I plugged it in. It went, Bleh! and Buckman always felt I did that on purpose. I have no idea why. But in that band, we had you know incredible people. We had uh, Ed Metz Jr. and 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 you know. Uh, uh, Dave, Dave Gannett and people like that. I think, I don't remember Charlie was playing with the band then, but, but so he insisted that I be kicked out of the band. Buckman did. So Ed, uh, was, you know, didn't want to lose Buckland. It was more important to him than having me. So he, uh, he, he wrote me this letter with him and Buckland as managers of the 10th Avenue jazz band telling me that I, I had been late and therefore I was fired. So I was pissed off at Ed for a few years. Well, he tried to find cornet players that were any good to could do this stuff. He, he had to write out all their souls. It was really horrible. And, uh, but he used to then invite me over as a guest artist to all the festivals he sponsored. So I would play, you know, and then he would always have me in, in the all-star band and then he would play trombone and he really wanted me back so finally he made when i was uh i got a i was uh hired as an all-star to uh to replace this really great cornet player who's also a little bit crazy um what the, who the hell is that uh anyway <clears throat> that they had at the uh, edinburgh jazz festival every year uh, because he he would just he just got too crazy. He refused to play on odd numbered four levels and things like that. Uh, so they the the guy who was uh, on the board, uh, I played with uh, with in, in one of Ed's things, and he really dug my playing. So he said, "Send us a tape. I'll see if I can get you there." Well, they, I got the gig. They paid twenty five hundred dollars plus airfare over and back for my wife and me, and free room and board. And it was a great thing, Edinburgh Jazz Festival. And Ed was there, and he had uh, he had uh, the trumpet player from from, from the uh, from Professor Plum uh, as his trumpet player at that time. And he was having a lot of troubles with it, and it wasn't working out well. And so he came over and, and, and was listening to me play because I was playing in the All Star bands over there, and. Uh, then he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. In those days, it was thirteen hundred bucks a month just to come and rehearse once a week, and then he would pay airfare and everything for me and my wife to go to all the gigs he had in all these different places, and I'd get paid for the gigs. And I said, "Okay, I forgive you." <laughs> yeah, he has a habit. Of, he has a habit of doing that. That's kind of how I ended up. I ended up in the band uh, via the Hot Frogs. And uh, when he negotiated my contract, it was a similar, a similar thing. Uh, it, it must be nice to have that kind of money. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. But uh, he was, the thing about Ed is he put his money where his mouth was. It, I mean, you know, not only sponsoring, of course, all those festivals and, and taking care of us. He was, he was just phenomenal. I, I really enjoyed the man. I think for some reason he's gotten a really bad rap in the, in the trad circles. Uh, but at least by the moody figs. Well, you know, he, he wasn't uh, uh, a great a great improviser. You know, he, he was not what I consider to be one of the great trombonists or anything. But uh, and and but he had uh, he had moved with his when when after he left high school, he married a woman who was Filipina, 
Right, Rosita. Yeah, Rosita. We met her in Huntington Beach, I believe. She was working at Beach Music at the time, because I lived right down the street. So how I, <laughs> I knew that when he finally related the story to me. Well, that was, before, that was up in Portland, and they couldn't go into restaurants together because of the prejudice of a mixed marriage, you know. They, they, they couldn't even get an apartment. They finally, that's why they moved to Los Angeles. And uh, then he got lots of stuff. He got lots of work. And, you know, that's where he met Jackie Kuhn, who was one of my big influences. Um, and uh, then he also went to Vegas and uh, got lots of gigs uh, rearranging for singers that sang in the key of F sharp minor or whatever, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and learned how to do all that real fast, do fast arrangements. It was amazingly fast. Yeah, yeah. He's a whip out arrangement. You know? One thing I learned about Ed is you had to be careful what you said around him. Because if you mentioned you liked a tune or a style, the next day he would have three arrangements. For you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> or when we had Al Weeb come show up, the guitar player from Vancouver, Al mentioned that he had been in a psychedelic band in the, in the 70s. And the next day, bam, there are three, you know, three rock tunes in the, in the 10th Avenue book. Well, in the 10th Avenue band, uh, when Ed took singing lessons in the late 90s, yep, I was there. He got to be a pretty good singer, I thought, and uh, and he wrote a lot of stuff. But we played everything from the Beatles to, uh, you know, Coltrane. I mean, we played everything in Dixieland, and he sang, but he sang every tune. Oh yeah. You know. And when it came to improvising a tune, a simple tune like. Uh, uh, a train or something like that. He 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 stumbled around a little bit, and he wasn't really a great improviser. But and he had a good voice. But I'll tell you how 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 he died. Uh, we were working. Uh, the band was working a lot. We had a schedule a year ahead, playing two times a week at least, and we're getting paid well. And uh, we were uh, our, we had to get Bocce's in Santa Cruz. And he was not looking good. He didn't, he, he didn't look, you know, he looked like he was feeling good. And we were worried about him. So we, uh, we wanted to follow him on all, his way, all the way home, which was a long drive for him. Well, when he got home, he had, uh, he had a stroke. And they took him to the hospital and uh, then found out he had a big brain tumor. At the same time, they they did all the stuff they could do, but he died during that. I played at his uh, at his memorial service. Uh, I played uh, just a closer walk by myself. You know, there were lots of people there. He was very well loved by lots of people. He'd done a lot of good things for a lot of people. Uh, I, I was devastated when I when I heard the news. Um, he, was, he meant. Uh, was, uh, Sorry. <laughs> That's no problem. But but he did so much for me as an individual and as a person. He and I um, talked a lot uh, when I was with the, in the band. And uh, I just, I've got to tell this guy. Um, yeah, Gary, I'm I'm on a, an interview right now. I'll call you back. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> those things those things happen. But but uh, Ed was a big influence in my life. He told me. So much wisdom. Um, one, just one example is when we were having problems with personnel, let's say, in 10th Avenue, I would, I would pull him aside and, and express my grievances. He said, Dan, one of the things I learned in the real estate business is that if somebody isn't working, it's kind of like a thorn in your finger. Eventually, the body works it out, and it just pushes it out. And the, and he goes, people are that way. He goes, in my business, I don't fire people. He goes, but everybody else creates the environment that they want to leave. <laughs> and I, a brilliant, a brilliant piece of philosophy, you know? Yeah, that's true. And then the other thing he told me was, uh, I was like the boulder. Me personally, I was like the boulder in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> that either you came along with me or, or you got out of the way because I would win. <laughs> You know, and uh, so I love the man. I, I was devastated when I heard the news. Well, at one point, I got so tired of opening every concert with uh, 
whatever the hell it was we opened with. San Francisco Bay Blues. Yes. <laughs> that uh, I finally, uh, I quit for a, a few months and uh, <clears throat> then came back into the band. But uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, when I got a job teaching at uh, a high school, teaching sciences uh, uh, in, in uh, Campbell, California, at a high school in Westlake. And uh, I couldn't leave that, that, that ha I got the job in, to start in January, and he wanted me to go with him to New Zealand and, and Australia, and, and I, you might have been on that trip. I was. Yeah, and I couldn't do it. So he hired, I think, a really top trumpet player in, in Australia. Just, Eric Holroyd. Yes, Eric Holroyd. Yeah. So he got a better deal than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eric was a lot of fun. He and I became very, very fast friends. Um, pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, I, I was going through my uh, 10th Avenue uh, recording collection, and I think you are on every CD that you ever made with that, with that group. Um, I, and we had, uh, we had a lot of different trumpet players come through when I was in it uh, during that time. Uh, Phil Kirk played for a while with us, and Eric, of course. And uh, I think you know, on our Hungary tour, we had Rusty Styers playing lead, playing trumpet. Oh, that's right. The Rusty came in, yeah. Yeah, and then we had uh, a guy named Josh, who did one of the. Yeah, he was a Las Vegas high note guy. Yeah. Right. He played good solos. I mean, he he had a good ear. He played really good solos, but they were so friggin' loud, man. Oh yeah, he did the Hoggins and Norway tour. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when it time, came time to record, though, you were the guy in the booth, you know. And uh, I, I, I have actually published a few of the cuts on my one of my uh, YouTube sites of the uh, Rampart Train album. And uh, everybody just loves it, you know. And of course, uh, you were spectacular on, on everything we've done. Well, you know, I, it, it's, it's hard. About the only playing I get now is uh, has been on Saturdays jamming with these guys, and then the Santa Cruz Jazz Society, where I where they used to hire me every uh, every month or actually every week to play and lead their jam sessions, and then it became every month, and now uh, they do it online, and uh, I'm I don't get paid to do anything, but I come on anyway. Uh, that's a little playing I get, you know, but they play it with i i real books. Click, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. That's about the only playing I get because practicing is, has always been against my religion. Yeah. <laughs> Although sometimes I have to, I have to break my, my religious rules. Well, I, 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 don't, I think I agree with you in that as far as the jazz playing is concerned. Um, I, have to do, I have to do maintenance on the physicality of it and the, and the actual um, techniques of playing a brass instrument. But very seldom do I sit down, especially as a tuba player, and go through saints. You know, you just don't. <laughs> There's only so much you can do as an individual tuba player to practice jazz. Yeah, well, or to practice anything to keep your chops alive. No, nope. uh, but I, I have to. I, I was. I watched a video once of a great uh, violinist uh, and a European violinist. I'm trying to remember who it was, and how how he does things. You know, he gets paid. You know, forty thousand dollars for a concert. So he might go for a month without a gig or a month and a half. He doesn't play. But then uh, a week before the gig, uh, he picks up his his low quality violin and he starts playing on it. And then he picks up his, his uh, Stradivarius and he plays on it and then he goes plays a concert. But he, he doesn't like to practice. He practices for performances. That's about what I do if I have a gig I'll practice to get my chops back up, you know, because, but I haven't had a chance to practice for today, for example, but I can go over there and still do sure. it. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, well, let's, I've, I've had a monthly thing going on with one of our jazz societies in the area. Um, the preservation for the uh, Disneyland Jazz from, out of Duarte, California, they've, they've actually put together a distanced uh, band concert once a month where we do about two hours worth of tunes. Uh, for the for the jazz club, uh, and then produce produce it online. But I've also participated in a bunch of the click track uh, 
kind of multi multi window things, which are just a pain in the butt. Yeah. To edit, well, not that so much to do, but what can I say? Uh, I, hopefully, we'll get out of this. You know, we'll we'll turn the corner. And although I tell my interviews I don't like to talk about the situation we're in, uh, we can talk about the fact that we're going to get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, and uh, I hope that we still have fans. I I was just telling my son this morning uh, on my that Friday gig that I do, uh, we've lost two of our st uh, stalwart fans just this week, um, unfortunately have passed. And uh, that's a problem with the, our fans of, of Dixieland jazz or of trad jazz is, you know, we're at that, they're at that age pretty much. Well, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing to me is uh, it's, it's in, there are a whole lot of different pockets where trad jazz was revived. And they each were different. You know, they had different players like the Pacific Northwest. That's where, uh, you know, Monty Blue was and all that. The East Coast, uh, Chicago, New Orleans, Kansas. And then in, in Central California, like Monterey, I played a lot. That's where I played with Jake and all these people. And then in Southern California, where I have not played. And yet there's a whole lot of people down there. And they, we all play... Uh, the similar repertoire, but a little differently each time, how we do it. So, so if I go down to Southern California and they call Rampart Street Parade, which has got all these very set parts, I still don't know for sure how many times we do this or that, you know, because it's different in different places. <laughs> yeah, and things like a lot of form tunes are that way too, uh, and whether, what they do and how they do it. The thing about Southern California is we're, we're fortunate enough to have the theme park uh, Mecca down here where a lot of Disneyland players get work through both Disneyland and, and other theme parks in the area. And I know there's a little bit of that in the Bay Area uh, with the Marriott Great America. Um, you know, the, that's, that's usually kids, 18 year old kids or something. Right, but like Bob Sequoia came out of that and a few of the, speaking of people who went through 10th Avenue as trumpet players, by the way. <laughs> um, and and so it, the those those venues have been uh, really instrumental in keeping uh, traditional jazz alive for the for at least for Orange County and for LA County. It guarantees that there are musicians trying to make a living, <laughs> going going through it and learning the style. Speaking of original members or uh, members that have been through Tenth Avenue, I did interview Dan Marcus. Oh oh yeah, he's a great player. When I moved up to. Uh... I got a job uh, to start a, a junior high high school up in Bellingham, Washington, and and Dan Marcus was living up there then. You know, he had and he had done a tour. Uh, I, I, you probably know this story. Dan and uh, Dan Marcus and uh, and uh, oh, what the hell is his name? The the, the guitar player Paul Paul Mailing were both uh, from Half Moon Bay. And went to high school together, and their and Dan's father was a clarinet player, a good clarinet player, uh, kind of a uh, kind of a, a, a recluse. But they'd come down and sit in with us with uh, Jake Stock's band at the Catalyst on Friday afternoons uh, in Santa Cruz, and uh, got to be quite good players. They learned a lot there from that band, and uh, uh, so Danny uh, heard about auditions for the Ray Charles band were going on, and I guess Los Angeles, you probably know the story, and uh, and of course he had not been invited, it was by invitation, but he, he flew down there, took his horn, called up the guy, because he had the number, and he said, hi, it's Danny Marcus, what time's my audition? The guy says, what? We don't have any Danny Marcus on, what? You mean I flew all this way down here and you don't have my name? So the guy always said, okay, come in at 3.30. He <laughs> came in and he won the solo spot, and, and and the Ray Charles band, and, and he flew all over the place in Asia and everything. And unlike the other players in the band, he saved his money because uh, everybody else kind of spent it and blew it and everything. And he took his money and started a business selling uh, office furniture to schools and businesses and things like that. He had a little computer that had a printer in the bottom. In fact, when I was putting my school together in Bellingham, he lived up there. And he came in, and we did a whole twenty thousand dollar order with him at that point. But uh, 
but that's what that's how and he had a nice house his son, his son is apparently quite a genius from what I understand uh, that he had only one one child and he used to play uh, that band in 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 Seattle the trad band um, oh I can't remember uh, uptown lowdown yeah uptown lowdown he was good bar sure and, and he didn't play a a C or B flat tuba he played an E flat tuba so everything he played he was playing on an E flat tuba which I was going to like Holy shit! And he played all over the place, you know. And he, so he was playing in weird keys and things. A brilliant guy, you know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the only way Charles story that Dan told me uh, on an, on his interview, in fact, was that he used to play chess at the back of the bus with Ray. And uh, and one day Ray said, uh, "Wait a minute, you're watching my moves." <laughs> and and Dan says, "What?" He goes, "Don't worry, I'll take care of it." He reaches up and he turns off the light on the bus. He says, what are you doing? He goes, I can hear you breathe, and I know what you're thinking. And so, so Ray would move, and then he would turn the light back on for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, Dan had uh, made a, a, a jazz recording uh, with people in that band that he brought back with him. Uh, it was very good. You know, he, was good. He, play, he, he was like me. He played, could play modern jazz, or he could play Dixieland. He had all. He, oh, yeah. And Dan and I actually had a discussion one night on a bus somewhere about a physical manifestation of jazz changes. How you could represent in sculpture a lead sheet, basically. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I'm still working that over in my head about uh, how that can be done. But it's kind of a neat idea, you know? Well, that's interesting. I mean, uh, what, you know, I, the way I learned to play jazz is it was not with lead sheets and... and uh, music you know I, I learned trad jazz I had already I had already heard all this stuff but then when I could see it with my eyes and Lou Waters arrangements I got a better idea of what was going on but if that's all I had just those you know visual uh, uh, charts I wouldn't have become that good a player it was you have to play with your ears and your eyes closed I always play with my eyes closed I open them up when I have to <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that when I was on the Misbehaving Jazz Band. Uh, I would take a solo on sousaphone with my eyes shut, and I would open them up, and sometimes Brian Shaw would be an inch away from my nose. <laughs> just to scare me. And it, was, it was effective in scaring me. But, yeah, you know, some people, I mean, like Louis used to, his eyes used to uh, roll back in the back of his head. He used to look up. Yeah. And it, it has to do with how you access your memory, I believe, and where the cre creativity is. So, in your own brain. Yeah, they've measured brain waves of jazz musicians when they're, when they're solo and when they're playing, you know. And uh, obviously not drummers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, people. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so what are you, what have you been doing before this all started happening? I was, doing a, I was doing a weekly gig at uh, a place called Curly's Cafe in, in Signal Hill, California with a, with a set band called the Cherry Willow Jazz Band. And I've been teaching. Uh, I've been teaching high school marching band and jazz band for as long as I've been, uh, probably as long as I've been out of college. Um, most, I'm also involved in marching band and drum and bugle corps world. My son's the director of a drum corps down here and he's a high school band director at a local high school. And uh, so that, like that, you know, um, doing a lot of arrangements. I actually go drill <laughs> for marching bands and things. Um, but other than that, uh, just married, I've got, I got my kids and my wife and I've got three grandkids now. Oh, hard to wrap my head around because mm -hmm. I'm still Dan as far as I'm concerned, but it, it is kind of interesting. Isn't it? It's getting older. Well, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I, when I, uh, sold, I, I was divorced from, uh, my wife, Willa. Who is, I knew Willa. Yeah. Uh, and she lives up in Mount Shasta now. And we, we sold the house and split it. And uh, uh, she bought a place up there. And so I came up. I, I got into a relationship with a woman who's now my wife. That was back in 2016 or something. And uh, we didn't think we could get married because uh, from what we understood, if... Uh, 
that we would have, she would have lost her, uh, you know, her social security because it was based on the previous husbands who they were divorced 40 years ago or something. And uh, so we didn't get married for the longest time. So I was just driving up, you know, and staying with her four nights a week and uh, bought a boat to stay on the other nights that I couldn't, you know, and so on. So when the house was finally sold um, and uh, we split the money, Will and I split the money, um, we, uh, after all the debts were paid off and everything, I uh, basically started playing mostly up in the Bay Area, Menlo Park and playing at Savannah Jazz and uh, had gigs. Um, I had several gigs. I, I was playing probably three three nights a week, and uh, those were really good gigs. And uh, they were jazz gigs. They were you know modern jazz gigs. And then I'd go to the San Jose Jazz Society, Hot Jazz Society, to play. You know, to get my stuff, keep my 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 trad shops alive. And uh, that all just poof, gone. You know, yeah. nothing, nothing. So, uh, so it's 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 tough, and I'm I'm now over in Alameda. It's a, another scene over here, but nothing's happening anywhere. And there's Berkeley and Oakland and Alameda, and then I go across the bridge, and go back to other places. But Savannah Jazz, which was the main big you know jazz place, uh, where all the great people came through and played at Savannah Jazz, uh, the guy who owned it, who's a, a college professor, actually, a uh, black guy who, who plays uh, guitar quite well. Uh, he uh, teaches at uh, University of San Francisco, but he's owned it for years. He had to, they raised the rent on him and all kinds of stuff, and he was losing his ass, so he had to, you know, sell it. He had to, you know, get rid of it. And he wants to open up another club somewhere that's bigger so he could make more money, but that ain't going to happen until well, this is all over. Right. right. Did I read that you spent some time with Stumptown also? Yeah, I played I played for a year with Stumptown. And that was fun because, you know, it was it was all you didn't you didn't need music. I mean, you didn't need, you know, to read anything. Everything was, you know, that way. I listened to several of their tapes before I started playing with them. So I understood how they did things. And of course it was a little different than I was used to doing. So I had to, you know, get that right. But yeah, we played all the festivals and everything like that. And that was fun. Most of those people that I played with are dead now. Uh, that's not quite, which is, you know, what happens. <laughs> yeah. And I played, uh, I played with a band called uh, Bathtub Gin. Sure. You know, Bathtub Gin. And uh, that was North Storms <laughs> and, and Bob Storms. Bob played the clarinet with uh, Ed for a Yeah, he did. I was in the band when he, when he played with that. He's a real nice fellow. And uh, they had this band, and we played all around the Pacific Northwest. and Got paid pretty well, and we rehearsed once a week. So that was uh, when I moved up to Bellingham to start this school. Um, uh, one, of the, one, of my, one of the jazz fans, one of the trad jazz fans who knew me, who uh, lived up there uh, told Bob about me that I, I had come up because they just lost their cornet player had moved down to Seattle and wouldn't be able to make all the gigs so much. And so Bob called me and we you know, immediately meshed. We made a couple recordings and worked a lot. You know, that was a good band to be in, but I had to get out of it when I had to move. Back. Yeah. The only thing I have to say about Bob Storms is you have to be a little bit so it's a different kind of crazy to teach junior high. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that's, that was his bread and butter was junior high band director. And I'm serious. I tried it for a little bit. And uh, I don't know. That's not an Asian group for me. It's, it's, hey, well, if I hadn't had Mr. Betts in junior high, I would never learn to play Dixieland. You know? uh, that's true. That's true. But anyway, yeah, Bob's a great guy. Nice, nicest guy in the world. But what, what you don't know is about his brother, North Storms. This guy is crazy. He always has a rubber chicken. He always has, uh, you know, uh, a mask. Uh, you know, who was that masked man? You know, I, the guy <laughs> was, was so fun to play gigs with him. 
he wasn't a great trombone player, but he knew where to put the notes, you know, which was good. But, you know, I turned into a real Bria Sklonberg fan. And Bria Sklonberg, the trumpet player. Oh, oh yeah. She's a nice. And and she would get a concert, and Bob actually, she knew Bob. But Bob came up and played a played a uh, a tune with him, and so I went, oh man, that's you know that's kind of cool. Well, I got to play uh, with uh, Gunheld. Uh, what's her name? Harling. Yeah, she. Oh, she's incredible. She's a, a genius. I had I had arranged for an inter- interview with her, and uh, the day that we were supposed to do the interview, she didn't show up, and. <laughs> And uh, and so we were still having to work out schedules as far as getting her to come on the show. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. Well, I hope you can get her because absolutely, she's just she, she's she absolutely. Uh, I would consider her to be much more. And you know, Bria is a good player. Sure, plays the changes nicely and all that. Knows the idiom, but but Gunhild is. Uh, is, is probably the genius of today in terms of trad jazz. If she were just doing trad jazz. I, I, I mean, and marketing of nothing else. But, you know, it, it came from her family. Her dad was the king of swing of, of uh, Sweden. Yeah. And uh, the family, family lineage in jazz goes back a very long ways. Oh, and well, so king, it, was the king of Sweden giving her everything she was needing? <laughs> dum, dum, <psst. laughs> that guy, I was really anxious. Yeah. Oh, you missed it. Yeah, I missed it. Well, listen, Bruce, I'm, I'm going to have to let you go here. And thank you so much once again for agreeing to do this. Okay, thank you. Maybe at some how, point. How, how do we find this? How do we? I have a I have a, a YouTube channel called Trad Jazz Today. Oh, Trad Jazz Today. That's right. Okay. And, and all you have to do is uh, search it on YouTube. And uh, and you'll see all. I've done over 60 interviews so far. <laughs> And I only started in July. Yeah, you're you're like uh, making history here, or le- or before it all goes away. <laughs> it's giving me something to do and keep me out of my wife's hair. So what can I say? All right, so you take care now. Okay, you too. And good luck with uh, with everything coming your way. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Trad Jazz today. Dan posts new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Make sure to check out the archive of past shows, and please give us a thumbs up when you subscribe to the channel. Bye.